Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvelous video. Be honest, what's the first thought that comes to your mind when you hear the iconic phrase, I want to play a game with you? Well, if you ask us, it's either mutilated life or mutilated death. Because trust us when we say there's no going back from there, especially if the one saying it comes as a creepy looking puppet on a toddler tricycle. It's fair to say, not only have you been marked for the ultimate test, but you're also about to lose your mind, along with your body parts. This brings us to the Saw franchise, comprising nine electrifying movies and the tenth installment, all set for a late September theatrical release. With Saw X about to serve itself as a direct sequel to the first movie, which was released way back in 2004, as well as a prequel to Saw 2, it's time we take a look at the whole franchise, which at the end of the day is nothing short of a long-winded maze filled with never-ending twists, secret schemes, a madman's traps, or so it seems, crooked cops, <laughs> dare we disregard the flashbacks. This brings us to today's video, where we'll be doing a complete breakdown of the entire franchise. We'll explore all the movies as per the timeline inside the flicks on display, and not by their release dates. Mind you, there'll be a lot of coming back and forth to the movies, but at the end of the day, your questions will be answered. So, are you ready? Let's take a look at the entire Saw timeline one bloody moment at a time shall we? But before we get into our explanation, we do have a very small request. If you enjoy our content, then please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Jigsaw. We know what you're thinking. How can we possibly begin with a movie that serves itself as the eighth installment in the franchise? The answer is pretty simple. What we're dealing with happens to be the mega horror franchise of Saw, and in this long-running game of will and retribution, Anything is capable of taking place, and you most certainly shouldn't be judging this particular book by its cover. Now, speaking of Jigsaw, the movie has two storylines, and while it's made to look like the stories are running simultaneously, in reality, they're not. Storyline 1 features five people, each with terrible secrets waking up to find themselves inside a barn filled with death traps and forced to take part in a series of deadly games. Storyline 2, on the other hand, revolves around detectives Brad Halloran and Keith Hunt, investigating a series of murders, which resembles the modus operandi of the Jigsaw Killer, but John Kramer has been dead for about ten years now. So, to those of you wondering what the hell just happened, here's the twist. The actual test featured in the film that shows five people in the bucket head trap at the barn was in fact one of the very first games that was orchestrated by Kramer, which occurred even before the events of the first flick. No wonder, half of Jigsaw served itself as a prequel to the entire Saw franchise, giving us viewers a peek into Jigsaw's early days and also revealing an apprentice, one we'd not seen before. So, while we promise to unfold to you the complete plotline of Jigsaw in detail, right now it's time for us to delve deeper into the starting block of the franchise to see how the pieces all fit together. Saw. The first entry, but certainly not the one chronologically, has photographer Adam Stanheit and oncologist Dr. Lawrence Gordon waking up and finding themselves chained inside what looks like a dingy, dilapidated industrial bathroom. Both are freaked out to find a body of a man lying between them in a pool of blood out of their reach, and by the look of the man's half-blown head, he looks like a suicide victim given the revolver and microcassette recorder he's seen holding in his hands. Adam and Gordon, upon discovering microtapes in their pockets, decide to play them using the recorder from the dead man. Both tapes are by a similar man, who's used a pitch modulator to have his voice distorted and to keep his identity as a secret. Adam's tape wants him to survive, while Gordon's tape tells him to kill Adam before the clock strikes six, or else his wife and daughter will die, and he'll be left to rot in the bathroom forever. With Adam discovering a bag inside the toilet tank containing two hacksaws, he and Gordon attempt to saw through their chains without success. It eventually dawns upon Gordon that the hacksaws are meant for their feet, thereby identifying their captor as Jigsaw, a notorious serial killer known for cutting out the skin of his victims in the shape of a jigsaw puzzle piece. The viewers are presented with a flashback. The first of many and two of Jigsaw's previous victims are shown. Both Paul and Adam had failed to survive their respective lethal traps or games as Jigsaw would address them, the razor wire maze and the flammable jelly, the result of which led to their imminent deaths. Detectives David Tapp, Stephen Singh and Alison Kerry, while investigating the murders, had found a penlight belonging to Dr. Gordon at the crime scene, 
which led to Tap and Singh reaching out to the Angel of Mercy Hospital in order to question and interrogate Gordon. It's here where we first get to see John Kramer as a patient of Dr. Gordon. While Gordon's seen addressing Kramer as his patient and discussing about his terminal brain cancer with his medical students, an orderly named Zepp walks in and tells Gordon that the patient has a name and that it's John. Coming back to the interrogation, Gordon's alibi checks out and he's asked to view the testimony of heroin addict Amanda Young, Jigsaw's only known survivor, who was left with no choice but to disembowel a man in order to get a key out of his stomach and free herself out of the reverse bear trap. We're brought back to the present timeline where Adam is pretty sure that it's Gordon who kidnapped him in the first place. With Adam picking up a piece of glass that he'd broken earlier, he realizes it's a two-way mirror, which he breaks and discovers a camera behind it. Of course, someone's watching the duo from a monitor, and it's through another flashback that we learn how Gordon's family got kidnapped in the first place. Gordon's daughter, Diana, was sure of someone being inside her closet, and her fears proved true after Gordon left the house, leading to her and her mother, Alison, being held as captives in their own home. The house is also at the same time being monitored by Detective Tapp from a house across the street, and it's through a different flashback that we learn how Tapp got discharged from the police force. Tapp's unhealthy obsession with the Jigsaw case had led him and his partner, Singh, to one of Jigsaw's lairs, where they not only encountered a victim of Jigsaw on a drill chair, but also the orchestrator himself. While they were successful in saving the man from the trap, Jigsaw ended up slitting Tap's throat using a blade. Singh went after Jigsaw, only to trigger the quadruple shotgun trap in the hallway and have his head blown off in the process. In the present day, Tap is even more fixated on Jigsaw and is quite convinced that it's Gordon who is the real killer. We also get a glimpse of the captor, who's revealed to be Zepp, the orderly from the hospital. Back in the bathroom, Gordon unearths a box that has two cigarettes, a note stating that the cigarette is harmless, but Adam can be killed with it and a one-way cell phone. This is also when we learn how Gordon was abducted in a parking lot. While walking to his car, he heard a camera taking a photo, but didn't pay attention to it, and with him attempting to make a phone call in the garage, he was ambushed by a pig-masked person. As for Adam, he recalled his abduction after a strong electric shock was sent through his chains after he tried to fake his own death with a cigarette on the instructions of Gordon. A flashback has Adam returning home and putting up pictures of Gordon in his dark room, only to get attacked by the same pig-masked figure later. With not much time left for the clock to strike six, Gordon receives a call from Allison, who's being held at gunpoint by Zepp, and she tells him not to believe Adam. Gordon confronts Adam, who confesses to him that Detective Zapp was the one paying him to have him spy on Gordon, further revealing to him that it was him who took his picture in the parking lot, and that he was also aware of Gordon's affair with one of his medical students, whom he visited the night he got kidnapped. While it dawns upon Gordon that he's being tested because of his affair, the clock strikes six, and Zepp posts, seeing that Gordon still hasn't killed Adam, proceeds to murder Gordon's family. However, unbeknownst to Zepp, Allison had already managed to free herself. As Zepp hands the phone to Allison to call up Gordon and tell him that he's failed, she manages to take control of his handgun. However, she gets distracted by Diana, and Zepp takes this as an opportunity to overpower her. Shots are fired, which has Tap rushing to their apartment to save the mother and daughter. And Gordon, who happens to be on the other end of the phone, thinks that Zepp has killed his family. Allison and Diana are able to run away from there, and although Tap wounds Zepp, he's not able to stop him from leaving the house. Zepp is determined to kill Gordon, and he's followed by Tap. Gordon, in the meantime, receives a shock just like Adam did, and post having a mental breakdown, ends up sawing his foot, much to the horror of Adam. Please know that while this is taking place, Zepp and Tap have already reached the building where they engage themselves in a fight, and it ultimately leads to Zepp shooting Tap fatally. As for Gordon, he's able to move freely post cutting off his foot, and crawls over to the dead man to take his gun and loads a bullet that he'd found earlier in his pocket along with the tape. Just as he shoots at Adam, Zepp is seen entering the bathroom. Zepp points his gun at Gordon, says he's too late, and he must kill him because those are the rules. However, it turns out that Adam isn't dead yet, and he bludgeons Zepp to death with the toilet tank cover. Gordon crawls out of the bathroom, promising to come back with help despite Adam begging him not to leave. With Adam searching Zepp's body for a key, he finds another tape, which reveals that Zepp was just another victim of Jigsaw, who was only following the rules to get hold of an antidote for a slow-acting poison coursing through his body. Around the same time, the body lying in the middle of the bathroom gets up and reveals himself to be John Kramer, aka the infamous Jigsaw everyone is after. John lets Adam know that the key to his chain was in the bathtub he'd woken up earlier, but it went down the drain with the water, right in the opening scene. A desperate Adam tries to shoot at John using Zepp's gun, but John is fast enough to shock him through his chain, post which he turns off the light and shuts the bathroom door, saying, Game over, sealing a screaming Adam inside the bathroom forever.
Saw 2. The second installment begins with police informant Michael Marks finding himself enmeshed in Jigsaw's Venus flytrap, which is basically a helmet filled with multiple sharp nails locked around his neck. He learns through a videotaped message that the key to the trap has been surgically placed behind one of his eyes, and if he's not able to retrieve the key before the timer runs out, the mask will close on his head. Michael is unable to cut his own eye and becomes the recipient of a gruesome death. We're next introduced to Detective Eric Matthews, who's currently seen working a desk job. After a verbal spat with his son Daniel, he's called to the scene of his informant's murder, where there's a message left for him by Jigsaw. Later that night, Matthew recalls the logo of the padlock that was used on the trap device, and assembles a SWAT team joining Detective Kerry and Officer Rigg, all in the hopes of apprehending Jigsaw at the lock company's abandoned factory. Upon reaching the old warehouse, they finally come face to face with Jigsaw in his new hideout. John's rapidly advancing brain cancer has made him visibly weak, but he doesn't waste time in letting Matthews know that his son is being held captive inside the nerve gas house along with seven other people. A set of computer monitors prove that John isn't lying, and he tells Matthews that Daniel and the others have been breathing a poisonous nerve agent, which will kill them all within two hours. However, if Matthews sits down with John and plays his game, the latter assures him that he'll see his son. A reluctant Matthews begins his test in order to buy some time for the tech team to arrive and trace back the video signal. We learn from the duo's conversation that the sole reason Eric has been chosen for Jigsaw's game is because of him being a brutal officer in the past, mainly for his actions of putting people behind bars on bogus charges and planting evidence to convict people of crimes that they didn't even commit in the first place. John is also seen revealing his primary motive behind his games. It was a failed suicide attempt after him being diagnosed with cancer that led him to a newborn appreciation for life, determined to spend the rest of his days testing the very fabric of human nature with his games. Back at the house, the victims, which comprised Daniel, Gus, Obi, Laura, Addison, Jonas, Xavier, and also Amanda Young from the first movie, are informed by a tape recorder about the toxic gas and that there are antidotes hidden throughout the house which they need to find within two hours in order to make it out of the house of horror alive. The tape also provides the group with a cryptic clue, but with Gus choosing not to pay heed to the warning, he becomes a victim of the magnum eye hole trap getting shot in the eye by a .357 Magnum. The rest are seen emerging out of the booby trap door and eventually reaching a basement, where another tape recorder reveals that it was Obi who helped Jigsaw in kidnapping the others. The tape instructs Obi to acquire two antidote syringes from inside a furnace, but he accidentally triggers the furnace trap, which locks him inside and burns him alive. The next test is for Xavier, who's condemned by Jigsaw for being a drug dealer and asked to retrieve a key from a pit filled with countless hypodermic syringes and then open a door that contains the antidote. Xavier throws Amanda into the pit, who's forced to retrieve the key, but despite that, he fails to unlock the door in time. This has him highly frustrated, and he abandons the rest. It's precisely around this time that John reveals to Matthews that all the people who were trapped in the house are ex-convicts, who had been framed by Matthews at one point, thereby implying the danger that Daniel is in if the others discover his connection to Matthews. This has Matthews angrily destroying John's models and plans, but the latter remains unbothered. Xavier, on the other hand, discovers a number written on the back of Gus's neck, and he realizes that each of them must be having a number on the back of their necks, which, when combined, will ultimately open the antidote safe that the first tape recorded message had stated. Jonas finds his way to Xavier and mistakes him, asking him to turn around, as Xavier is attempting to harm him. In short, Jonas doesn't stand a chance against Xavier, who ends up hitting him in the back of his head with a nail-studded bat, which kills him instantly. While Xavier is seen going after the rest to collect the numbers, Laura succumbs to the nerve gas, but not before discovering that Daniel is Matthew's son. Addison is disgusted by the revelation and goes her own way to find the antidote, but she gets her arms caught up in a glass box, which has its opening lined with sharp razor blades. Xavier hears her screaming for help and comes to her only to take a look at her number, thus leaving her to bleed to death. With Xavier ultimately learning about Daniel's true identity, he goes chasing after him and Amanda. Matthews, who's had enough of John and his philosophical ramblings, ends up assaulting him even going to the extent of breaking his finger to know of his son's location. John agrees to take him to the house, and it's right after they leave that the tech team is able to trace the video signal 
and they decide to follow it. As for Daniel and Amanda, they somehow find themselves inside the dilapidated bathroom from the first movie, which currently has the severed, decomposed foot of Dr. Gordon, as well as the corpses of Adam and Zeb both in an advanced state of decomposition. Xavier, having followed the duo, corners them inside the bathroom and asks Amanda for her number. After Amanda taunts him, asking how will he read his own number, Xavier is seen cutting out the skin from the back of his neck, post which he charges at the duo, only to have Daniel slit his throat using Dr. Gordon's hacksaw from the earlier movie. The SWAT team, in the meantime, arrives at the location of the video signal and discovers it to be an empty house. It eventually dawns upon Kerry that the whole footage of the group trap that they were presented with was pre-taped. And as the two-hour timer is up with Matthew's game, Daniel is discovered in a safe, breathing an oxygen mask inside the very lair of Jigsaw. As for Matthews, he's oblivious to the whole thing and arrives at the actual location as directed by John, only to get ambushed and knocked unconscious by a pig-masked figure inside the dingy bathroom. When he regains consciousness, he finds his ankle chained to a pipe. A tape recorder left beside him reveals Amanda as Jigsaw's accomplice, and we learn how she was framed by Matthews and sent to prison where she became addicted to heroin. The tape has Amanda addressing Matthews as her first victim, and having found a father, leader, and teacher in John Kramer. Of course, Amanda makes an appearance outside the bathroom door and says the iconic, game over. After which she shuts the door and leaves Matthews to die inside. The movie ends with a badly bruised John, smiling, satisfied that his master plan has worked. Saw 3, Saw 4. Call it wild, but the events of both Saw 3 and Saw 4 take place at the same time, a fact that is disclosed toward the end of the fourth movie. We'll begin with Saw 3 that's seen picking up right after the events of the previous movie. Detective Matthews manages to free himself by smashing and breaking his foot using a toilet lid and escapes the bathroom. Six months pass by and Officer Rigg and his team discover the crime scene of another Jigsaw victim. A flashback reveals how the victim Troy, a regular in terms of repeating prison sentences despite having a privileged upbringing, wakes up to find multiple chains attached to his body which he has to rip off before the timer goes off. He's unable to do so and gets killed in an explosion caused by a nail bomb. Detective Kerry arrives at the scene and points out to Rig and Detective Hoffman that Troy was never meant to escape the trap because the door to the room was welded shut, thus going against Jigsaw's methods of letting his victims have an opportunity to survive. That night, Kerry gets abducted from her apartment while watching the tape from Troy's game and finds herself in an inescapable Jigsaw trap that has her ribcage torn out despite putting her hand inside an acid beaker and retrieving the key to the trap. We're next introduced to ER doctor Lynn Denlin, who gets kidnapped from the hospital by a pig-masked person. Lynn is strapped and wheeled into a room by Amanda, who brings her before John Kramer. John is on his deathbed and has an inoperable frontal lobe tumor. She's asked to keep him alive for the duration of another person completing Jigsaw's game and has a device locked around her neck that will fire five shotgun shells, blowing her head off if John dies or she attempts to escape. Speaking of the other test subject, Jeff is seen trapped inside a crate. He seems to be in an abandoned meatpacking plant, and as part of his task, he gets to decide whether or not he wants to forgive people involved in the death of his eight-year-old son, Dylan, who was run over by a car while playing at the park. Lynn is seen working on John, and upon seeing his condition, she tells Amanda that he needs to be in a hospital right away. Amanda grabs her by her neck and tells her that John isn't leaving the room. This is precisely when John starts having a violent seizure, and Lynn tells Amanda to give him oxygen and hold him down. John starts bleeding from his mouth, but Lynn takes control of the situation and stabilizes him. With Lynn stating to Amanda that John needs to have an immediate surgery, Amanda tells her that the surgery has to be done where they are. Coming back to Jeff, his first test leads him to a freezer room where he finds a naked woman suspended by her wrists. Jeff recognizes the woman as Danica, who was the only witness to Dylan's accident, but she drove away instead of staying back to testify. There are two poles spraying ice-cold water at Danica at random intervals, and she can be saved if Jeff is willing to get the key to her trap from behind the frozen poles. While Jeff is able to get the key, he's unable to help Danica from freezing to death. Jeff's second test has him coming face to face with Judge Holden, who was responsible for giving Dylan's killer a lenient six-month sentence. He finds Holden chained at the neck to the bottom of a large vat that starts getting filled with liquefied pig carcasses. The key to save him is inside an incinerator filled with Dylan's toys, and Jeff has to burn his late son's possessions to lay his hands on the key. With Holden urging Jeff not to become a killer and convincing him to save him, Jeff burns the items, gets the key, and frees Holden at the 11th hour. As for Lynn, she's left with no choice but to perform a spontaneous surgery on John so as to relieve the pressure on his brain using the tools provided by Amanda. While the surgery is taking place, John has flashes of a woman, and mistaking Lynn for her, he grabs her by her arm and says that he loves her. 
Amanda walks in, and distressed by John's actions, she walks out of the room to cut herself. Yeah, it's disclosed that Amanda resorts to self-mutilation when she finds herself in stress. A flashback reveals how Amanda was the one to have kidnapped Adam from the first movie, and had set up the bathroom trap. John had injected himself with something that slowed his heart rate and relaxed his muscles in order to play dead. Cut to the present, the surgery is a success. Amanda comes back to the room and hugs John. Lynn tells her that John can't hear her, which pisses her off to the extent that she attacks Lynn and even pulls out a gun. John tells her to put away the gun and leave the room. We get another flashback where Amanda is seen returning back inside the bathroom after the events of the first film to give Adam a mercy killing, asphyxiating him with a plastic bag and in the hopes of freeing him from his misery. Jeff, as part of his third test, finally encounters Timothy Young, the man responsible for killing his son, placed in a device known as the Rack. Judging by the looks of the trap, it categorically happens to be one of the most painful jigsaw traps, as it's meant to twist and break the body parts of his victim. With the Rack starting to twist and break Timothy's limbs one after the other, Jeff initially doesn't do anything about it. After all, it's been three years that he's wanted to kill Timothy every day. But with Holden snapping him out of his vengeance mode, Jeff decides to save Timothy but his actions lead him to trigger a shotgun, which kills Holden, and he's unable to save Timothy, who gets his head twisted 180 degrees by then. The scene shifts back to John and Lynn, and the latter is seen stating how she'd do anything to see her husband. With Lynn begging John to let her go, he holds her hand. Amanda sees this and goes out of the room to watch on the monitor how Jeff is doing. She also finds an envelope with her name on it, the contents of which distress her further. She comes back to the room and John tells her to let Lynn go, but she refuses to do so, citing that Lynn hasn't learned anything further, stating that she doesn't believe anybody changes after being tested. She starts yelling at John, and a flashback takes us back to the beginning of the movie, where Matthews is seen limping down the hallway after escaping from the bathroom. Amanda was attacked by Matthews, and after the duo fought briefly, she was able to incapacitate him and leave him there for dead. The present timeline shows Amanda still arguing with John. As for Jeff, he finds a door that leads him to the place where John, Amanda, and Lynn are only to find Amanda shooting Lynn. Lynn, who's disclosed to be the wife of Jeff, falls into his arms, and Jeff shoots Amanda out of rage in her neck. As Amanda falls on the ground succumbing to her wounds, John explains that this whole time, it was Amanda who was being tested on her will to keep someone alive. John was aware of her motives, and how her traps weren't winnable, as was in the case of Troy and Kerry. Of course, he didn't want a murderer to carry on with his legacy, and therefore he'd chosen Amanda for the ultimate test of granting someone the gift of life, and she wasn't made aware of the fact that Lynn and Jeff were husband and wife. Jeff is next seen pointing his gun at John, who tells him that he still hasn't learned anything from his ordeal. John offers to save a dying Lynn, and Jeff only needs to forgive him for that. However, Jeff ends up slashing John's throat using a power saw, and tells him that he forgave him. John, before dying, pulls out a tape recorder that addresses Jeff, stating him that he was his final test, and he has failed in that. The tape also informs Jeff that his daughter, Corbett, has also been captured, and he has to undergo another test to know about her whereabouts. As the tape ends, Lynn's shotgun collar trap gets activated, and her head explodes. Jeff finds himself sealed in the room with the dead bodies of John, Amanda, and his wife, Lynn. Saw 4 begins with John Kramer's autopsy, where a tape is found inside his stomach. Detective Mark Hoffman is called in to listen to the tape, which states Jigsaw's games have just begun. Well, it turns out right as the following sequence shifts to a mausoleum, where two men are found chained at the necks to a winch. While one of the victim Trevor's eyes are sewn shut, Art has his mouth sewn, making it impossible for them to communicate with each other. As the winch starts pulling them together, both start to panic, with Art ultimately bludgeoning Trevor with a hammer and getting a key from the back of his collar to set himself free. We next find the police discovering the body of Kerry, and Officer Rigg rushes to her hanging corpse. Detective Hoffman warns Rigg never to barge through an unsecured door, and is introduced to FBI agents Peter Strom and Lindsay Perez, who are pretty sure there's an additional accomplice of Jigsaw, apart from Amanda, as Kerry weighed more than Amanda, and she possibly could not have set her up in the trap all by herself. Officer Rigg is later seen watching an interrogation video of Jill Tuck, who happens to be the same woman John had flashes of during his surgery, and she is also revealed to be John's ex-wife. That night, Rigg gets attacked at his apartment, and Hoffman disappears as well. Rigg, upon waking up, finds a videotape that lets him know that Matthews is still alive, and Hoffman's life is at risk too, and that he has 90 minutes to save his colleagues. As part of his first test, he finds a woman named Brenda placed in a hair trap, and through another videotape, he learns that she's a criminal and is instructed to walk away. 
As the trap gets activated and starts pulling Brenda's hair back to an extent that it begins to tear her scalp, Riggs' natural instinct to help people in need leads him to get her out of it. However, when he frees her, Brenda attacks him with a knife. Rig is able to overpower her by throwing her into a mirror. Rig finds a tape in Brenda's hand and learns that she was told to kill the officer that came to save her to avoid getting arrested. Rig also finds two keys one of which is a hotel room key, and leaves from there. A flashback of Matthews lets us know what happened to him after his fight with Amanda. Someone had dragged him into a room and locked him in for six months, providing him with food. Little did Matthews know that he was only getting prepped for his final test, and that brings us to his current location, where he's seen standing on a block of ice with a noose cinched around his neck. Hoffman is right next to him, strapped into a chair, and there's an electrode by his feet. Both are seen at two different ends of a balanced scale, and it becomes evident that if Matthew slips off the ice, he'll be hanged and Hoffman will end up getting electrocuted. They're also observed by a man in the same room, who isn't disclosed to us at the moment. Coming back to Agent Strom and Perez, they're informed about a few gunshots heard at Riggs' apartment, and they break into his place, only to find him long gone and Brenda lying dead, probably from blood loss. Scanning through the pictures found at the apartment, they start thinking that Rig is the new killer, but upon finding a picture of Jill tucked there, they realize they're missing out on something. Rig is seen arriving at the motel and walking into a room using the key he'd gotten as a clue earlier. He finds a box on the bed which has a pig mask inside, a tape recorder, and a picture of the motel manager, Ivan. The second task has Rig abducting Ivan, who's revealed to be a serial rapist, and forcing him inside a room that has a prearranged bedroom trap, which ultimately leads to Ivan getting dismembered. Coming back to Stram, he's seen interrogating Jill, asking her what her picture is doing at the crime scene. A flashback reveals a man named Cecil getting himself into a fight with Gus, one of the victims of the nerve gas house trap from the second movie, inside Jill's addiction recovery health clinic. Cecil pulls out a switchblade, but John intervenes the situation and tells him to leave from there. This has John concerned over the safety of Jill's workplace, especially as his wife is pregnant with their first child. Another flashback shows John's workshop, and he's disclosed to be an engineer and building designer. John shows Jill the crib he'd built for their unborn son Gideon, along with the puppet Billy, which, to be honest, wasn't that creepy back then. Now, as part of Rig's third test, he comes at this school where he had once hit a man named Rex declared not guilty, despite him physically abusing his daughter. It was Hoffman back then who had intervened the situation, in order to avoid disciplinary action being taken against Rig. Strom and Perez, in the meantime, have arrived at the motel crime scene, and they deduce that Rig is recruited as the new jigsaw killer. They also discover that the room was previously rented by a man named Art Blank. Is it the same Art from the mausoleum trap? Well, we're about to find that out. The FBI agents figure out one of Art's properties, and when they go there, they find a surveillance camera there. It becomes clear to the duo that they're the new targets in Jigsaw's game. Coming back to Matthews and Hoffman, the former, having had enough of everything, jumps off the ice block, but the man who's been observing the duo puts him back on the block and points a gun at Hoffman. He tells Matthews that if he does it again, he'll shoot him. Hoffman recognizes the man from the school incident. Not only is he revealed to be Art from the mausoleum, but another flashback also discloses him to be a lawyer defending Rex back at that time. Cut to present, Rick finds Rex and his wife Morgan inside one of the empty classrooms placed in a spike trap, which has the duo impaled together with metal rods. As part of their test, Morgan had to pull the rods out of both of them to survive. While Morgan's rods pass through non-vital points of her body, we can't say the same regarding Rex. When Rig finds the duo, Morgan had already pulled out most of the rods which meant she'd killed her abusive husband by then. Left with the last rod, Rig helps her out and sets off a fire alarm to notify Morgan's position. Rig also finds a picture of his wife there that has the message Go Home written on it. Upon realizing that the font of G is similar to the letter on the Gideon Meat Factory, he decides to go there instead. Perez and Strom reach the school after Rig has left, only to link Art with all the victims. Having defended each one of them in the past, and let's not disregard the fact that Art was also Jill's lawyer, a photographer gets accidentally killed at the crime scene, and the agents decide to scan the entire school. They enter another room to find the puppet Billy sitting in the middle, surrounded by burning candles. A tape on Billy states that Perez's next step is critical, and Strom will soon take the life of an innocent man. As Perez takes a closer look at Billy, 
the puppet's face explodes, shooting shrapnel into her face. While she's rushed to the hospital, an exceedingly furious Strom goes back to interrogating Jill, and we finally learn about the backstory of Jigsaw. A flashback shows Jill closing up her clinic when Cecil bangs on the door, telling her that he left his jacket inside. Jill lets him in, only to realize that he's come to rob her clinic. Cecil, on his way out, inadvertently opens the door, which hits Jill on her stomach and causes her to have a miscarriage. John and Jill's relationship is seen falling apart post this incident, and he also gets diagnosed with terminal cancer. A different flashback shows Art in John's new office space, and we learn from their conversation that John was tasked with creating low-income housing for needy families. A severely depressed John doesn't care about things anymore and tells him to leave from there. This even led him to attempt suicide, but post-surviving his car accident, he became an entirely different man. When Jill had discovered pictures of Cecil in John's office, she charged at John, and that's when we learn how John began his deadly series of games with Cecil as his first victim. John had abducted and placed him in a knife chair trap, and given him the choice to either bleed out from the wounds on his wrists, or press his face through a series of sharp kitchen knives. Cecil's chair breaks when he's at it, and this leads him to attack John, but the latter falls into a pile of razor wire after John simply sidesteps. Strom, while interrogating Jill, is able to to make a connection with the Gideon Meat Building and decides to go there, realizing that the place is the scene of Riggs' final test. Inside the building, in one of the rooms where Art, Matthews, and Hoffman are, Matthews pretends to have fallen asleep, and this leads to Art attempting to wake him up. With Art getting close to Matthews, the latter attacks him. Art tells him to stay alive till the timer goes off. We realize Art is also a part of the game when we see a device strapped to his back which has pincers around his neck. Anyway, Art is seen handing a loaded gun to Matthews and eagerly waiting for the 90-minute timer to run out because only then will he be released from his device. However, if the door to the room gets opened before, Matthews' head will be crushed with the two ice blocks which are hanging overhead, and Hoffman will also die along with him. Rig, who's made it to the building, is supposed to let his timer run out, but instead, he makes his way into the room despite Matthews attempting to warn him and shooting him with the guns that Art gave him. As Rig crashes through, he triggers the device that crushes Matthews' head. Rig shoots Art dead, holding him accountable for the game and not giving him a chance to explain. Art's tape informs Rig how he's failed his final test, and had he not barged through the door in the hopes of saving his colleagues, everybody would have been alive. Strum, who's also arrived at the building, gets lost inside. We suddenly find Jeff from the previous movie also inside the building, and while this does make one consider that he's looking for his daughter, but in reality, this is where it gets divulged that the events of Saw 3 and Saw 4 are happening at the same time. Strom, in due course, finds himself encountering Jeff in the same room that has the dead bodies of his Lynn, John Kramer, and Amanda. While Jeff believes Strom to be involved in his daughter's abduction and points a gun at him, Strom shoots at him as an act of self-defense, thus fulfilling Jigsaw's previous warning of him causing the death of an innocent one. However, the main twist of this movie is still yet to be seen. Hoffman reveals himself to be the other accomplice of Jigsaw, much to the complete shock of a dying rig. He walks out and locks the room Strom is in, without the latter's knowledge, making the whole events of Saw 4 taking place before John's autopsy is conducted. Saw 5. Convicted murderer Seth Baxter finds himself bisected by a swinging pendulum blade when he finds his trap rigged to be inescapable. As he dies, someone is seen watching him getting sliced from a peephole. Next, we find Agent Strom escaping the room he was locked in upon discovering a hidden door. A tape addressed to him tells him to stay where he is, but Strom disregards the warning and walks down the hallway only to get attacked by a pig-masked figure, who, in all probability, happens to be Hoffman. Strom next finds his head in the water cube trap, which is basically a sealed glass cube around his head that starts getting filled with water. While the trap wasn't meant to be escapable, Strom is able to survive by performing a tracheotomy with the help of a pen. The police are seen arriving at the giddy and meat factory where Hoffman is seen coming out of the building carrying Jeff's daughter, Corbett. He says nobody survived inside, only to find Strom being carried out on a stretcher, still alive. After the death of John, Jill receives a box from John's lawyer that John had left for her. A videotape of John reveals to Jill that the contents of the box are of great significance, and she's seen using a key necklace to open it. Hoffman, on the other hand, gets awarded and promoted for his work on the Jigsaw case, post which he's seen going back to his office to find a note that warns, I know who you are. This has him distressed, and he's seen later visiting the hospital, where we find Strom sitting next to an empty bed, mourning over the loss of Agent Perez. Strom already looks suspicious of Hoffman and asks him 
how did he manage to get out of the building without a scratch, further telling him that Perez's last word was Hoffman. Hoffman does his best to remain calm in front of Strom and leaves from there. Strom is paid a visit by his boss, Agent Dan Erickson, who takes him off the jigsaw case. As for Hoffman, he's seen entering a dark room that has a model setup of a new game along with a bunch of monitors, having on display five unconscious people. The new victims are Ashley, Charles, Luba, Malik and Britt, who find themselves waking up in a sewer. A videotape featuring Billy informs them that all of them are connected to each other in a way and so are their neck collars to cables that will pull them back and decapitate them if they're not able to free themselves within the given time limit. Billy also leaves them a hint telling them that while their lifelong instincts will tell them to do one thing, they should be doing the opposite. Ashley, who's revealed to be a former fire inspector having lost her job post faking an accident report to cover up a case of arson, is unable to free herself and gets beheaded. Strom, in spite of being on medical leave and, more importantly, removed from the jigsaw case, heads over to the FBI headquarters where he finds a file on Seth Baxter, who's revealed to be the murderer of Hoffman's only family member, his sister, Angelina. Strom gets confronted by Erickson on his way out, but he lies to him, telling him that he was just picking up some stuff. Strom is next seen going to Seth's murder scene. After thoroughly reading up on the case and learning that Seth was released on a technicality, serving a bare minimum of only five years in prison, he comes to the conclusion that it was Hoffman who killed Seth and then made it look like a jigsaw trap. Back in the sewer, the remaining group make it to another room where we learn more about them. Luba is a city planner who granted building permits in exchange for bribes. Britt is the vice president of a real estate company, and in short, all of them were involved in a building fire that took the lives of eight people. The group's second test has them acquiring keys to bomb shelters before the timer expires, and with Charles unable to land himself a key, he gets killed in a nail bomb explosion. Coming back to Strom, he's seen carrying on with his research and thoroughly going through the case files of the past jigsaw victims. A flashback reveals how it was actually Hoffman who was looking through the peephole when Seth was getting sliced by the pendulum trap. John is able to figure it out and has Hoffman abducted and reprimanded for not even giving Seth a chance to survive his trap. Eventually, John plays a mind game with Hoffman, post which he's seen taking him under his wing. Strom is seen walking out of the headquarters when Erickson sees him again, but loses him when he walks out of his room. Hoffman, who's made up his mind to frame Strom, tells Erickson that he believes there's another accomplice of Jigsaw, and possibly someone from inside. This has Erickson thinking, and he's also surprised to find all the Jigsaw files missing. As for Strom, he goes to Paul's razor wire maze trap as depicted in the first movie, and a flashback reveals that Paul was actually kidnapped by both John as well as Hoffman in piggy masks. It was Hoffman who had provided the mugshots of the ex-convicts for the nerve gas house trap and helped set up the game. He was the one to alert John about Detective Tapp as well, and Hoffman had led Tapp to Dr. Lawrence Gordon on the instructions of John planting the doctor's penlight at the crime scene. Britt, Luba and Malik are seen entering the next room that has a bathtub in the middle and the task is to connect the five electrical cords with the bath water and have the door to the room opened. Britt ends up stabbing Luba and using her body as an electrical conductor to unlock the door. Erickson, in the meantime, has Jill coming up to him and telling him that Strom is stalking her. That brings us to Strom, who's seen arriving at the room inside the Gideon building where he was locked. Another flashback reveals John handing Hoffman an envelope which had pictures of the five people abducted and put to test in the sewer right before Amanda wheeled in a strapped Lynn to him. And Hoffman is seen going out of the same hidden door that Strom had also discovered. Cut to present, Hoffman is seen making his final move in terms of framing Strom and calls up Erickson using Strom's phone that he had earlier picked up from the evidence room in order to make Erickson track the phone signal and lead him to the location of the group trap. Hoffman goes back to the sewer observation room and intentionally places Strom's phone next to the monitors. As part of their final test, Britt and Malik have to give ten pints of their blood to open the final door. Both ultimately realize that all five of them were supposed to work together as a team, and by doing that, they would have all won and survived at the end of the day. Realizing the blunder they've made, they decide to saw their arms and give enough blood to open the exit door. Erickson reaches the sewer observation room post following Strom's phone signal and finds his phone along with his own personnel file, both intentionally kept there by Hoffman. As for Strom, he's seen going after Hoffman inside a building which actually happens to be the refurbished nerve gas house. In one of the rooms, Strom comes across a transparent box filled with broken glass and a tape recorder. The tape suggests Strom to get inside the box if he plans to live, but knowing Strom, he doesn't do that. Instead, he has Hoffman inside the box and shuts it. Erickson is able to locate both Brit and Malik and calls for medical attention while also putting an APB on Strom, convinced that Strom is the new jigsaw killer. Coming back to Hoffman and Strom, the door to their room gets shut and Hoffman signals Strom to play the rest of the tape, which states that if Strom doesn't get inside the transparent box, he'll die in the room. Soon, the walls to the room start closing in, and 
the transparent box starts moving down into the floor. Strom tries his best to break into the glass box. He even shoots at it, but nothing happens. Strom runs out of time and gets crushed to death in the trap room by the closing walls. Saw 6 The movie begins with Hoffman continuing to frame Agent Strom even after his death by staging a two-person test with victims Simone and Eddie. They're revealed to be loan sharks who have been denying policies and claims for their own profits, and a videotape lets them know that whoever is able to cut more flesh from their body and have the balancing scale in his or her favor within 60 seconds will survive the test. While the test is initially seen working in Eddie's favor, Simone chops her entire arm with a meat cleaver and puts her severed arm in the weighing scale, which leads to Eddie's death as he gets screws drilled in his temples. Next, we're introduced to William Easton, the insurance executive at Umbrella Health, and he surely is tight-fisted. His past action, as revealed in a flashback, has caused the death of his client, Harold Abbott, whose health insurance policy was deliberately revoked as part of Easton's dubious business policy. We come back to Hoffman, who's called to Eddie's crime scene. Fingerprints have been found on Eddie, and they belong to Stram, whose severed hand has been retrieved by Hoffman in order to implicate him further in traps and cover up his own work. Erickson introduces Hoffman to his new partner, revealed to be Agent Perez, who had faked her death and is still very much active on the case. Of course, this shocks Hoffman, who didn't have the slightest idea about it. Erickson is also seen offering unfettered access and disclosure to the FBI investigation. Later, at the hospital, Hoffman bumps into investigative journalist Pamela Jenkins, who's shown to be highly involved in the jigsaw killings, having published a book on the killer as well, but he doesn't give her any information. The next scene shows Jill Tuck at her apartment having opened the contents of the box that John had left for her. It contains six envelopes with numbers, and one of them happens to contain the picture of Pamela, making it very clear clear to us that she already has become the next target. Hoffman, who's with the medical examiner that performed John's autopsy, is told that the puzzle piece cut out of Eddie is made with a different knife than what has been used in case of all the previous jigsaw victims, and that the only person the knife matches with happens to be that of Seth Baxter, the victim of the pendulum trap. Erickson and Perez decide to analyze Seth's tape so as to make out the real voice of the person who made the recording. Hoffman is clearly bricking himself, but nonetheless, remains calm. Hoffman visits Jill at her clinic and is given five envelopes as part of Jigsaw's next game. That night, William Easton gets abducted from his office and finds himself an oxygen crusher trap in the abandoned Rowan Zoological Institute. John Kramer appears in a videotape and tells William that he has about 60 minutes to complete four tests, and if he's unable to, the explosive strapped to his limbs will blow up one test after the other, and he'll never get to see his family. As part of William's first test, he's made to compete with his office janitor who's also in a similar trap like William. They have to hold their breaths, and whoever breathes will have the vice-like machine crushing their ribcage. The janitor isn't able to hold his breath, and he gets horribly killed. This releases William, and he's able to unlock the bomb shackle on his wrist. In a different room, a mother and son are seen waking up to find themselves trapped. There's a container of hydrofluoric acid connected to sprinklers, a lever switch that says live or die, and a timer, but there's no message or any tape for them. Pamela is seen trapped in a room across from the mother and son, and we learn through a flashback that she got abducted after a brief meeting with Jill at the latter's apartment. As part of William's next test, he goes into a room where he's asked to grab two handles. He finds his young file clerk and elderly secretary both hanging from a barbed wire noose, and he's asked to choose to save either of them. Given his business policy, he should be saving his clerk, as he's young and healthy, unlike his secretary who's old and has a history of diabetes. However, William ends up choosing his secretary and has his file clerk falling and swinging to his death. He takes the second key to free his other arm, and continues with his test but starts having flashbacks because of certain messages that are left under his shackles. He remembers having met John at a party where he'd mentioned John about the business policy that he created, which decides whether or not they'll be covering someone's insurance policy. We come back to Hoffman who gets a call from Erickson and is told that they found some evidence based on Seth's tape. Hoffman has a flashback, where he's seen setting up Timothy Young's trap and Timothy is seen unconscious. John and Amanda also arrive there, and John finds Hoffman carelessly dumping Timothy's body on the floor, which he doesn't like, and tells Hoffman that Timothy is a human being at the end of the day. John also meets Jill after that, who tells him how she wished he would stop with the killings, to which John hands her the key to the box he left her after his death without explaining its purpose back then. The box, along Along with the envelopes also had a package which Jill is currently seen dropping inside a door. Speaking of William, he's seen having another flashback. This time, he's at his office, and John's right in front of him, telling him about a treatment that has the probability of curing his cancer. William denies John because that wasn't apparently what John's doctor had recommended. Of course, 
This has John highly furious, and he told William that he'll be judged for his actions. Post this flashback, William is seen entering a boiler room that is filled with steam, only to find his legal counsel Debbie strapped in her chest to a harness that will shoot a spear right through her head if she doesn't reach the other end. What she does reach, and with great difficulty may we add, she realises that the key to the device is inside William's body, and ends up attacking him with an electrical saw. The timer runs out before she's able to retrieve the key, and her device activates, killing her on the spot. Hoffman arrives at the audio lab with Ericsson and Perez. It's already been disclosed that the voice of Seth Baxter's tape didn't match with John. The sound technician is currently descrambling the tape to figure out whose voice it is. Jill, on the other hand, is seen with the sixth envelope that John had left in the box and leaving in a car somewhere. As for William, he's seen entering his last trap, only to find six of his junior associates, collectively known as the Dog Pit, placed in the shotgun carousel trap, and he learns he can save two of them, only if he's ready to press a button twice that will drive a spike through his hand. William saves two women from the rotating roundabout, and lays his hand on the final key to remove his last bomb shackle. We go back to the audio lab where Eric and Strom are able to figure out that it is Hoffman's voice, only to get brutally killed by him. Hoffman doesn't want to take any chances and also sets the whole lab on fire after leaving Strom's fingerprints everywhere at the crime scene. Hoffman comes back to the observation room where he's been watching William's test to find a letter that Jill had earlier kept on the table for him. This note is revealed to be the same letter that Amanda had read and found very distressing as seen in Saw 3, and is finally disclosed to us that Amanda knew Cecil and was with him the night he robbed the clinic. It was basically Amanda who had encouraged Cecil to go to the clinic, which meant she was partially responsible for the death of John and Jill's unborn child. A fact John was not aware of, but Hoffman did. Amanda found the letter very distressing because it told her to kill Dr. Lynn or Hoffman would end up telling John about her involvement in Jill's miscarriage. Now you know what actually led Amanda to kill Lynn in the first place. She never wanted to, but she didn't have a choice either. Jill is seen entering the observation room where Hoffman is and sending a shock through Hoffman's chair. As this is happening, William gets to the final door before the timer comes to an end and finds himself in between the rooms of the mother-son duo and Pamela. William runs to Pamela, who's revealed to be his sister. As for the mother and son, they're clearly not happy to see William, and it turns out that they're basically the wife and son of the deceased Harold Abbott, and now they have the option to take revenge on Harold's murderer. While the mother isn't able to activate the die switch, the son does it willingly, which results in a wall of needles swinging down into William's room and injecting him with the hydrofluoric acid from the vat. As William gets melted in half, we find Jill strapping Hoffman to his chair and taking out the last item from John's box the reverse bear trap. She puts it on Hoffman's head, thereby revealing that John's sixth target was none other than Hoffman. She's seen setting the timer and leaving Hoffman with no means to remove the trap. But Hoffman is able to get out of the chair and his wrist restraints, and right before it activates, he slams the headset through a small window in the door to get the trap partially opened. He manages to force his head out of the headset and injures quite a bit of his cheek in the process. A post credit scene shows Amanda going to the room where Jeff's daughter Corbett's locked in and telling her through the door hole, not to trust the man who saves her. Saw 3D This movie begins where the first Saw film left off. Dr. Gordon is seen dragging himself through the halls after crawling out of the bathroom, where he comes across a hot steam pipe to mitigate the bleeding of his leg wound. The next scene shows victims Brad, Dina and Ryan in a public execution trap that ends with Brad and Ryan sacrificing their cheating girlfriend Dina, who's suspended above them to the center saw wheel, which bisects her. We come back to Jill, who's a witness to Hoffman escaping from his trap. Realizing that her life is in danger now, Jill seeks help from internal affairs detective Matt Gibson, and she offers to turn over evidence of Hoffman, revealing him to be Jigsaw's accomplice in exchange for protection. Hoffman, in the meantime, gears himself up for staging more traps. He begins with a group of racists and places them in the grisly garage trap, which brutally kills them all. We're next introduced to Bobby Dagan, who achieved fame and fortune pretending to be a Jigsaw survivor and had also written a self-help book. At one of his meetings with the real Jigsaw survivors, we see Simone and William Easton's secretary Addie from Saw 6, Malik from Saw 5, and surprisingly, Dr. Gordon amongst the known faces. Gordon sarcastically calls the whole thing a marketing gimmick and walks away. That evening, Bobby gets abducted after the gathering and finds himself waking up in a cage where he's informed by Billy on a television screen to do the jigsaw dance for real within a stipulated time if he wishes to see his wife, Joyce, alive. As part of Bobby's first test, his cage gets suspended and he's supposed to swing himself far enough from a series of spikes that are placed below his cage on the floor. He's successful in swinging his way out of the cage. A flash 
flashback reveals how Bobby had gotten the idea to fake his survival story. Detective Gibson is seen visiting Jill at a safe house after finding his name on a mirror left at the garage trap along with the reverse bear trap. He's convinced that Jill had previously tried to kill Hoffman with the reverse bear trap and urges Jill to stay at the safe house, believing that Hoffman wouldn't be able to locate her there. But it's Hoffman we're talking about. He sends a video footage to them and demands for Jill after creating a huge explosion at the site of the garage trap. Coming back to Bobby, he finds his publicist Nina with a fish hook jammed down her throat and tied up in a contraption. He has 60 seconds to pull the hook up out of her stomach, but Nina has to stay quiet despite how painful it might be. In short, she dies and Bobby goes to the next room where he finds one of his signed books. A flashback reveals a book signing event that had Bobby signing the book for John, who takes the book but leaves behind its outer cover. Cut to present, Bobby realizes that he'd actually signed his book to Jigsaw. Anyway, he next finds his lawyer Suzanne, placed inside a steel frame that has three spikes that will impale her through the eyes and mouth if Bobby is unable to lift and hold the given amount of weight. No points for guessing, he's unable to do so, which leads to her death. As part of Bobby's next test, he finds his best friend Kale blindfolded and with a noose attached to a winch. The task requires Kale to make it to the other part of the room that has only a few loose planks as support beams. Also, the key to free Kale hangs in the middle of the room. Bobby, despite trying his best to help Kale out and even throwing the key to him, is unable to save his best friend when the latter misses catching it and he gets hung in the process. It becomes clear that Nina, Suzanne and Kale knew about Bobby's lies and they were chosen to aid him in fabricating his story. Gibson, in the meantime, is able to figure out where the game is being played through the clues left by Hoffman. He goes to the garage trap where his name was written and finds a hidden door. He walks into a room along with a few officers and find a hooded someone sitting in a chair and observing Bobby's game. The hooded man is revealed to be Dan from the garage trap or whatever's left of him. Bobby's able to see through Hoffman's ruse, and a flashback discloses how Hoffman had caused the explosion only to switch Dan's body with his in the body bag to get easy access to the police station and that he'd been watching their actions the whole time. However, before Gibson is able to alert the police station, a remote-controlled machine gun pops up and kills them all. Back at the police station, medical examiner Dr. Hefner gets brutally stabbed in the neck by Hoffman when he opens the body bag. It's fitting to say that Hoffman kills everyone in his path to get to Jill's holding cell. We come back to Bobby, who finally makes his way to Joyce after pulling out two of his teeth and getting the combination to the door that has his wife locked inside. In the room, he gets shocked by the electric wires that are surrounding Joyce. Billy appears on the television and tells Bobby that he needs to put hooks through his pectoral muscles, hoist himself up, connect the extension cords and shut off the electrical wire. To those of you wondering, yes, it's the same jigsaw game that Bobby lied about doing in his book. While Bobby admits to Joyce that he was never a jigsaw survivor, he attempts to do the task. However, just as he's about to reach out the second extension cord, the hook rips through his skin and he falls onto the floor. The timer runs out and Joyce is encased inside what looks like a brazen bull and burnt to death right in front of Bobby. We come back to Hoffman, who finally gets to Jill and knocks her out. Next, he ties her to a chair and places the reverse bear trap on her head and starts the timer. Jill's face gets gets ripped open and Hoffman says the iconic game over. He's next seen blowing up his hideout, and as he prepares to get away, he gets attacked by three men in pig masks. One of them is revealed to be Dr. Gordon who takes off his pig mask, and a flashback shows how John had fixed up Gordon after the events of the first movie, and in return, Gordon became his apprentice, doing the surgery work for traps like stitching up Michael and Trevor's eyes. Gordon was also the one to give John information about Dr. Lynn, and with Hoffman, he's only acting on John's final request. If Jill was ever harmed post his death, Hoffman had to be punished. Gordon ends up shackling Hoffman to the same pole that Adam was chained to in the bathroom, and takes away the handsaw as well to make sure Hoffman doesn't have any means to escape from there. He seals the door with the same iconic phrase. Also, while the other two pig-masked figures are not revealed, they in all probability are Brad and Ryan from the beginning of the movie. The other half of Jigsaw. We know we've brushed upon the events of Jigsaw when we started explaining the Saw timeline, but here's where we'll make things come to a full circle. Criminal Edgar Munson is chased by the police, and he runs to the rooftop of a warehouse and picks up a remote placed behind a steel bar. The cops surround Edgar, and he asks for Detective Brad Halloran, who arrives there along with his partner, Keith Hunt. Edgar tells Halloran that he has to decide who will die, and Halloran tells his officers to only shoot at the remote in Edgar's hand. Edgar states that the game is about to start and pulls the trigger, which starts a timer somewhere else, but he gets shot in the chest by someone much against the order of Halloran. A severely wounded Edgar states that the game has already begun. The next sequence shows five people 
Carly, Ryan, Mitch, Anna, and an unknown person chained to a wall of buzz saws at a barn with metal buckets on their heads. A recording of Jigsaw lets them know the rules of the game. In order to survive, they have to offer blood. Soon, the chains begin to pull the group towards the wall, and everybody starts panicking. Anna intentionally lets her arm be cut by the blades and gets freed. She suggests the rest to follow her suit. Ryan, Mitch, and Carly are seen making out of the trap alive. The fifth person, however, realizes too late what to do and appears to die in the process. The corpse of a man with a bucket over his head is discovered hanging from a bridge and is brought to forensic pathologist Logan Nelson and his assistant Eleanor Bonneville for autopsy. Halloran is also there observing the autopsy and after the metal bucket is removed, the head is disclosed to be severed in half, presumably by the bus saw. The victim's neck has a jigsaw puzzle piece mark and a flash drive is pulled out of the neck which states that the games have begun again and that only four are remaining. We go back to the barn where Anna, Mitch, Ryan and Carly still find themselves in chains. Billy arrives on a bicycle with a sign attached to it that says, Confess. The chains start pulling them, and Anna tells everyone to confess. Mitch reveals he sold a bike to a kid who later died in an accident, and Anna reveals she'd lost her baby and messed up her marriage. The chains don't stop pulling them until Mitch sees a voice recorder attached to Billy and pulls it. The audio recording informs one of them is a thief who's been injected with poison. There are three needles before them. One has an antidote to the poison, one has saline, and the other has acid. The group has to quickly make the choice of injecting the needle, and their inability to make the choice will lead to their deaths. Carly turns out to be the purse snatcher, and had accidentally caused the death of a woman who suffered from asthma, but she refuses to make a choice. This has the chains pulling all of them upward, which in turn starts choking them. Ryan, who had grabbed all the needles by then, is forced to inject them all into Carly's neck. While his actions release them all from their chains, Carly dies a painful and bloody death having had acid injected into her. Using the number on the needles, the trio is able to open a door that leads them to an another room that has a no-exit sign written on another door. Another body is discovered outside a hospital, this time the corpse of a woman whose face is in a complete mess due to acid. Logan and Eleanor, while performing an autopsy, discover another jigsaw mark. Halloran, who is also present there, starts suspecting Logan and tells Hunt about it. We go back to the remaining trio in the barn and Ryan is seen attempting to walk out the door that has the no-exit sign only to fall and get his foot entangled in a set of razor-sharp wires which start tightening their grip and tearing into his flesh. Anna and Mitch attempt to help Ryan out, but they get trapped inside a silo, which starts filling up with grain. After the grain stops pouring, sharp objects start falling, and the duo finds it impossible to move. Ryan is forcibly made to make a choice to save them, and with him pulling the lever, the wires sever his lower leg and the door to the silo gets opened. Logan gets to learn about his assistant being completely obsessed with Jigsaw when she invites him to her warehouse. Eleanor's fascination with the Jigsaw murders have made her go to the whole extent of recreating several traps of Jigsaw. Hunt, who has followed the duo to the warehouse, takes pictures and plans to show them to Halloran. Back at the barn, a voice recorder with Mitch's name on it reveals that Mitch didn't confess the whole truth. We learn the kid he'd sold the motorcycle to was John's nephew. He sold the bike knowing that the brakes were faulty, and Kramer's nephew died as a result after getting struck by a truck. As part of Mitch's test, he suspended upside down and lowered toward a helical blade machine which is spun by the engine of the same bike. If he wishes to save himself, he has to reach down through the center of the blade machine and pull the engine's brake handle. Anna is able to stop the machine briefly, but it starts again, and Mitch gets mutilated inside. Meanwhile, Edgar's body disappears from the hospital, and Halloran orders John Kramer's grave to be dug up. The original jigsaw has been dead for years now and when the coffin is opened, Edgar's body is found lying there instead. Halloran and Hunt are seen raiding Eleanor's warehouse where they find a mangled corpse, and by the looks of it, it does appear to be Mitch. With Hunt going to Logan's house to arrest him, the latter tells him that Halloran is only trying to frame him up. He convinces Hunt that it was Halloran who shot Edgar in the chest, and this has Hunt redirect his suspicions on Halloran. With Eleanor meeting Logan later at his house, she tells him that she's aware of Jigsaw's game location. They head over to the barn with Halloran following them in his car behind. We go back to Anna and Ryan, who currently find themselves chained to pipes at opposite sides of a room. A man in a pig mask reveals himself as John Kramer, and he's seen setting up the game. John narrates them their sins, and we learn Ryan's reckless behavior in the past has caused the death of his friends, and that it was Anna, or John's neighbor to be more precise, who had suffocated her baby to death and framed her husband instead, leading him to commit suicide later out of guilt. Loading a shotgun with one shell, John lets the duo know that the key to survival lies in the middle of the room, and leaves them in the room. Anna, believing that John wants her to kill Ryan, rushes to get the shotgun, but when she shoots, the gun backfires, killing her. Ryan realizes the key to their chains were kept inside the shell by John, which is now destroyed thanks to Anna acting selfish and pulling the trigger. Logan and Eleanor, while exploring the barn 
house encounter Halloran. Eleanor is able to escape from there. As for Logan and Halloran, they're knocked out and placed in neck collars. A recording reveals that they're the last two players of the game. Both are asked to confess their sins or else their neck collars, which are rigged to fire laser cutters at their heads, will kill them. There are buttons in front of them that they need to press. Halloran presses the button of Logan, activating the laser cutters around him. This has Logan admitting his sin, and we learn how Logan was a doctor who mixed up John Kramer's x-ray reports with another patient, leading to John getting diagnosed a little too late. But despite Logan's confession, the laser cutters appear to kill Logan and he falls on the floor. Post this, it's Halloran's turn, and once his lasers get activated, he admits to letting innocent people die and criminals walk free. Logan is seen getting up right after this and taking off the neck collar, post which he reveals to Halloran that he is Jigsaw. The original Jigsaw game featuring five people in the bucket head trap took place in the same barn ten years ago, and Logan shows Halloran the long decomposed corpses of Anna and Ryan. A flashback shows how the unknown fifth person was Logan in the original game along with Anna, Ryan, Mitch and Carly, and that he'd failed to wake up during the trap which led him to get badly wounded by the blades. While he did appear to die, he was saved by John, who realized that Logan didn't have to die because of his careless labeling error. John trained Logan in his philosophy, and he's revealed to have been his first apprentice. Ten years later, Logan recreates the original Jigsaw game using the criminals who were freed by Halloran as the very players, but he only takes three players for the game, as the last two are him and Halloran. He chose Halloran for the game primarily because he was the one to let Edgar go, despite Edgar murdering Logan's wife. No points for guessing. Logan was the one to have shot Edgar in the chest in the opening scene. We get to learn from a flashback that Logan helped John prepare some of his earliest traps, which includes the infamous reverse bear trap and the rest as you all know. It's history. The movie ends with Logan stating that he speaks for the dead, activating Halloran's collar which slices his head open. Spiral. Homicide detective Marv Boswick goes after a mugger into a subway tunnel while the 4th of July celebrations are taking place only to get knocked out and placed into a trap by a pig masked figure. When Boswick wakes up, he finds himself in a subway trap where he's literally suspended by his tongue. A recorded message left for Boswick tells him that he can either sever his tongue and live, or he can just wait for the next train to run him over. Boswick is unable to escape, and he gets hit by the approaching train. We're introduced to Detective Zeke Banks of the South Metro Precinct Homicide Division, who's assigned the newly joined William Schenk as his partner by police captain Angie Garza. Banks, while investigating Boswick's death, realizes that the trap is similar to the methods of the deceased jigsaw killer. In the meantime, another homicide detective named Fitch, while pursuing a lead in the investigation of Boswick's murder gets abducted and placed in a trap, where he has to make the choice of either having his fingers ripped off or get electrocuted in a bath of water. We learn, through a footage provided by the killer, that Fitch in the past had shot dead an innocent driver. Of course, his actions were covered up, and a different flashback shows how he deliberately not responded to Banks' backup call for help 12 years ago, leading Banks to get shot. Fitch fails to escape and dies, and given Banks' history with Fitch, some officers start suspecting Banks behind his death. Moving on with the storyline, a box arrives for Banks at the station, which contains a piece of Shanks' tattooed skin and a small vial, which ultimately leads the police to a butcher shop. The place was more like a hobby shop before that Banks used to visit with his father, the former chief of police. Arriving at the butcher shop, a skinned corpse is found hanging, and a tape reveals it to be Shank. With bodies being discovered one after the other, Banks' father Marcus makes up his mind to track down the killer himself, only to end up getting abducted as well. Angie is the next one to get lured by the killer, and finds herself in a trap in the cold case evidence room located in the precinct basement. Her trap requires her to sever her spinal cord on a blade, so as to stop hot wax flowing from a pipe right onto her face. Banks is too late to realize that Angie is the new target, and when he manages to reach her, she's already died of her injuries. While pursuing a lead, Banks gets kidnapped and wakes up to find himself at a warehouse handcuffed to a pipe. There's a hacksaw lying near him, and he tries sawing the chains, but he's not able to. Banks briefly considers sawing his arm, but upon finding a bobby pin lying there, he's able to escape the handcuffs. As he wanders around the warehouse, he finds his former partner, Peter Dunleavy, chained and suspended from the ceiling. A flashback reveals how Dunleavy had killed a witness who was supposed to testify against a corrupt officer. He'd also planted a weapon on the innocent man, but somehow Banks remained suspicious of his partner, and with him reporting about him, Dunleavy wasn't only fired from the department, but also imprisoned. Please know that this was the incident that that led to Banks becoming a pariah within the department for ratting on a fellow cop. Anyway, we come back to the present and find a huge glass grinder machine in front of Dunleavy that's been designed to throw multiple glass shards at him at a very high speed. A tape recorder reveals that it's up to Banks to decide whether he wants to save him or leave him to his death. Banks is unable to free Dunleavy, who succumbs to his wounds. The detective 
is ultimately drawn to the final trap where he's stunned to find Shank still alive. Shank lets Bank know his real identity. He says his actual name is William Emerson, and he's the son of Charlie Emerson, the witness Dunleavy had murdered 15 years ago. Shank also tells Banks how Marcus, during his time as police chief, had introduced Article 8 that allowed police peeps to literally get away with murder to reduce crime. He further states how Angie worked alongside Marcus during his tenure to cover up corruption as part of the Article 8 policy that ultimately led her to get promoted to the post of captain when she was only 35. It becomes clear that Emerson wishes to make Banks his ally, and therefore he gives him his final test, where he reveals Marcus suspended like a marionette and having his blood drained. Before Emerson tells Banks what to do, he calls up 911, claiming to be a civilian that's being chased by a shooter. This results in a SWAT team getting dispatched to the location. Post the call, he hands a gun with a single bullet to Banks and gives him two choices. Banks can either shoot at a target, which will save Marcus but let Emerson escape, or he can just kill Emerson and let Marcus bleed to death. Banks makes the obvious choice shooting at the target that lowers Marcus to the ground loosening his restraints. The SWAT team arrives at the location by then, but they end up accidentally activating a tripwire, which leads to Marcus getting resuspended. However, this time, a gun is disclosed to be attached to the arm of Marcus, aiming toward the SWAT team when they enter the room. This leads the SWAT team to believe Marcus is the shooter, and they end up gunning him down. The movie ends with Emerson escaping from there and Banks howling in despair. The upcoming movie, Saw X. Kevin Groitert's Saw X is all set for a September 29th release, and here's everything we know about the next entry, which is set between the events of Saw and Saw 2. For starters, we have both Tobin Bell and Shawnee Smith reprising their roles as John Kramer, Jigsaw, and Amanda Young, and fans of this horror film series couldn't be happier. New to the list are Norwegian actress Sonovi McCody Lund, Scottish actor Stephen Brand, and our beloved Michael Beach, amongst others. The storyline, as made out from the trailer, shows John traveling to Mexico to undergo go an experimental medical procedure, hoping that it would cure him of cancer. But he eventually realizes that the whole operation is nothing but a scam, singling out the vulnerable. Of course, John has to take things into his own hands now, and he takes everyone involved in the fraudulent scheme, one after the other, through his infamous traps. Add to this some brand new, never-seen-before traps as well. Marvelous verdict. Well, that's all for today, and with this, we finally come to the end of our video here. Hope this helps and answers every question you've had so far about the entire Saw timeline. So, how excited are you about Saw X, and what's your favorite movie in the franchise? Also, who happens to be your favorite Jigsaw accomplice? We'd love to know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Now, if you enjoy this video, then please do leave a thumbs up. Also, stay tuned with us as we promise to come back with more exciting content. Till then, Goodbye and thanks for watching. Have a nice one.